our intention is actually uh, to dissect the issue uh, on this uh, history, uh, especially the syllabus for SPM. We really want to know that uh, from the experts. I mean, like we have invited today uh, Dr. Ranjit Singh Mali, uh, Professor uh, Kuke Kim, Tansi Kuke Kim, Dr. Tambiraja. So these, those, those are experts on this field, so history field. So we want to really know, really know what exactly is happening on the syllabus, which we, uh, I, uh, which we all know that uh, from the article wrote by Dr. Ranjit Singh Mali a few months ago, saying about 39%, about 25%, 25 to 30% of the actual content is missing. Uh, and uh, about 25% about Hinduism, Christianity and Buddhism is not there. I mean, like it's, it's, it's been, uh, <coughs> you know, replaced with uh, other facts. So we believe that history should be should be about facts and uh, what actually happened. It should be not be manipulated for the benefit for, of uh, of uh, individuals or, or any other reason. So we believe that through this forum that we can be. be Usually, when I talk to people in Malaysia and ask them questions about Malaysia, they don't know anything. Which is the first modern town in this Malay Peninsula? If I mention it, you'll be shocked. Because nobody talks about it. Even a simple thing like Kuala Lumpur. Why was Kuala Lumpur called Kuala Lumpur? They also don't know. Even the tourist guys don't know. I ask them, when you take tourists around Kuala Lumpur, where do you begin? Oh, with pride they shout, Dataran Madeka. Because Dataran Madeka emerged 100 years after Kuala Lumpur. So where did Kuala Lumpur go? This poor uh, city council, not, not city council, the Ministry of, uh, uh, no, Ministry of Culture and etc. In the old Sultan Abdulhamma, Sama building, started off uh, a museum in Kuala Lumpur. Nobody goes there. Even school teachers are not interested in where Kuala Lumpur began. There's so many things about Malaysia that Malaysians don't know about. For example, there is no country in the world with two kings. Malaysia has nine. And since when did Malaysia have nine kings? They don't know. And in the course of the development of the country, many Malay terms have been badly translated. So people are now confused. The Nigri was translated as state. Whereas it used to mean something else. So there was one seminar, one American lady student asked me, he said, why, is, why was Negris Milan called Negris Milan? Was it because it was the ninth state to be established? I say far from it. It was one of the early ones to be established. But it should not be called nine states should be translated as nine territories. Negri was territory. And the, what you call state today was expressed in a very complicated way. Like Slango. Sultan Abdul Samad. Okay? In treaties, official treaties. Sultan Abdul Samad. Yang di Pratuan. The term Sultan was used only in front of his name. Yang di Pratuan. Meaning, he who is made Lord. Because every Malay ruler must be elected. Not like in England, where the elders automatically succeed. Yang di Pratuan. Negeri Selangor dan segala jajahan takloknya. Negeri Selangor there referred to only the Selangor River Basin. And the others would be jajahan takluk.
translated into English as dependencies. Slango and all its dependencies. All official treaties were done that way. There were many, many other terms, even Kerajaan. Now Kerajaan is translated as government. Kerajaan does not mean government. Kerajaan means a situation where you have a king. So in every Kerajaan, there must be a Raja. That's Kerajaan. So the proper English word is kingdom or monarchy. I have asked some people to translate. It's the elected government. Oh, they say, no, no, uh, elected government, yeah. Then, then, then they say, kerajaan yang dipilih. I say, when did you, uh, when were you given the privilege to pick any Malay ruler? No, only certain group of people can elect a ruler. Not everybody. The public is not involved. So you see, you, you need to go back to history in order to explain the present. And it's no use saying like this and like that. Most of the time, people are guessing, politicians especially, they are the culprits. Not so long ago, somebody shouted. The Chinese, uh, the British brought in the Chinese. The British never, never brought in the Chinese. China, the British had every right to bring the Indians here because they were ruling India at that time. They were not ruling China. The people who brought the Chinese in were the Chinese entrepreneurs themselves. Most of them living in a strict settlements. But they were British subjects. Because since 1867, the strict settlements became a British crown colony. And that was the main reason why there was so much trouble when the British tried to amalgamate the nine Malay kingdoms with the Strait Settlements. Because these British subjects in the Strait Settlements did not want to become part of the Malay society. People like Anjik he was a British subject. They call themselves King's Chinese or Queen's Chinese. And when they formed their association in 1900, the association was called the Strict Chinese British Association. Chinese British. Not like in subsequent years, when the Chinese formed a political party, the Malaysian Chinese Association, Malayan Chinese Association, instead of Chinese Malayan Association. Like Obama is called African American, not American African. So there is a lot of confusion. Malaysians now cannot distinguish between ethnicity and nationality. And so children should be taught these things, should be made to understand these things. But they are just taught how to memorize. So our children are very good. You ask them. Bukan negara, they know to shout. Keluaran perlembagaan. They what is the meaning of perlembagaan? Bukan. It's pointless. If you don't explain things properly, today of course we are living in a country which is governed by the constitution. The constitution is the supreme law of the country. Any other law which contradicts the constitution is null and void. The people bring up all sorts of funny things. Oh, we want, uh, there are people who want Christianity to take the place of Islam. Absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish. How do you amend the constitution? You need two thirds majority. Hmm? And who holds two-thirds majority in parliament today? Christians? Or Muslims? Muslims. And in the case of Islam and the Malays, even two-thirds majority is not enough. 
the young Diputon Abu must give his consent. So who can make Christianity the official religion instead of Islam? Only the Malays. You see that the Malays are going to do that? So every other day they're quarreling, quarreling. I you tell you. For for older people like me, uh, it's terrible. I lived through the era of British administration. It was not like that. Now they're scolding the British all the time. Poor British people. They were the ones who first started the move to amalgamate the Sultanates and the Strait Settlements. They were the ones. They never practiced divide and rule. Never. They made the first move to, to, to form a, what was called the Communities Liaison Committee to bring the people together and to make sure that the major ethnic groups, Chinese, Malays, Indians, did not accuse them of favoring the person chosen to be chairperson. So they chose somebody from the small Swanese community, Ernest Emmanuel Clough, Tracy. And then they made a move <coughs> to scrape the vernacular schools in 1950. And who objected? The people here objected. They did not want the children all to go to the same school. And to understand all that, you have to go back to the history, especially between 1900 and Second World War. All the events that happened outside affected people here. The Communist Party. How was it first formed? The first Communist Party in this country was called the Provisional Commission of the Communist Party of China. That was formed in 1928. And then Communism came in a big way. How did it come? Most of those people who write about communism don't know how it came. It came from the island of Hainan. The Hainanese were the first people to bring communism here. I think many Malaysians don't even know what I'm talking about. Hainanese. The Muslims don't know because they eat me Hailam. <laughs> Whereas earlier, the Cantonese brought the ideology of anarchism. So the anarchist party was formed in Ipoh in 1921, earlier than the Communist Party of Malaya. The Communist Party of Malaya was formed in 1930 at Kuala Pila. Why Kuala Pila? Because there were a lot of Hainanese rubber tappers there. The rubber tappers in this country were mainly Indians, Japanese, or Hainanese. Because communism had to spread itself among the working class, not the bourgeois. So the majority of the Chinese who were pet petty businessmen and so on, they never supported the communists. In fact, they hated the communists. And one group that hated the communists a lot joined the Kinta Valley Home Guards. And who were these Chinese? They were called Pong Sai Chinese. So if you don't know the Chinese society, then you cannot tell the difference between Pong Sai Chinese, Hokkien Chinese, Hui Chiu Chinese, Kayun Chiu Chinese. So complicated. Just as the Chinese cannot tell the difference between Malayali, Punjabi, Bengali, they still call Punjabis Bengali. That's Malaysians for you. And can you imagine Chinese differentiating between Mandali and Nankawa? It's a lot. So unless you're very exposed, you cannot. And it's not easy therefore to write the history of this country. All the more then, you have to start from the very bottom explain the society 
and in doing so you need to explain more than just the society here because you have to begin from outside otherwise people don't understand and I know Mr. Ranjit Singh is very upset about the concentration on Islam in the Middle East it is not wrong to give a lot of attention to Islam but you must explain Islam dynamics in this country not talk about the Middle East alone there is no writing that I'm aware of on Islam, Islamic dynamics in this country. Because when people do research on Islam, they automatically go to Malay sources. The Malaysians are very cute, very, very, very cute. Yeah? The law says a Malay must be a Muslim. And they automatically say a Muslim must be a Malay. No, a Muslim need not be a Malay. I'm not a Malay. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. And Indian Muslims play such a big part in trying to enlighten the Muslims in this country. So when I ask people, Muslims, who was Hafiz Gulam Sawad? He came from India, no doubt, but he joined the legal service in the Straits Settlements. He was the third man in the world to translate the Quran into English. And a copy of translation is in the University of Malay Library. I have been trying to encourage people to reprint that. They are not interested. One day I was talking to people from Central Asia. I say in your area, the names of all the countries in in Stan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Rajasthan, North India was called Hindustan. I say we have Plantan. <laughs> Not a matter of coincidence, yeah. because many of the Pashtun from Central Asia settled down. I say, if India has Shahrukh Khan, <laughs> Salman Khan, Bantan has Abdullah Sapa Khan, one of the top civil Zaman Khan, top police officer. They don't explain these things. See, our concept of Malaysia is just too narrow. Malaysia is very, very broad. So in order to talk about the Chinese, you have to talk about China. In order to talk about Indians, we have to talk about India. For example, the Indians started forming associations in this country in the early 20th century. And who was the Indian? Who was the Indian personality to influence the North? He was a Bengali, not Punjabi, Bengali. And his name was Surendranath Banerjee. He was the one who influenced them. And Surendranath was very interesting because he was very naughty in India against the British. And the British called him, instead of Surendranath, Surrender Not Banerjee. <laughs> and when the British came here, what did they say? We do not want the Malays to be like the Bengali Babu. So you need to link British policy towards the Malays was based on the experience in India. If I don't explain India to you, how can you understand? The whole trouble with most people who write history is that they do not do research. Malaysian, Malaysia is a very, very lucky country. Because we have history, materials, Chinese, in Siamese, in Dutch, in Portuguese, in German, and some of our most important records with regard to politics used to be in India. 
I've been to the Tamil Nadu archive. And there's so much material on the Malay states in the 18th and 19th centuries. All we need is a historian who is very hard working. And I find young historians not at all hard working. I could read my curriculum from morning till night was this almost every day. Today they go to the library and read for two hours and they're tired already. But without doing that, and we have, we published the second English newspaper East of Suez in 1806. And all the newspapers, 1806, and at one time there were no less than eight English newspapers in this country, from Penang down to Singapore. And all these newspapers are found where? Do you know what? Supposing I want to read the Malay Mail of 10th September 1911. Our library is useless. Don't talk. In the British newspaper library in Collingdale, London. It takes them only 20 minutes to bring the paper for you. If you are going to base everything on mere impressions, wasting your time and please, please, if you are not certain, if you are not sure, don't cause trouble by making statements. The whole trouble with our people today is that all sorts of things come out in the newspaper and the poor members of the public <coughs> have no clue what is right and what is wrong. And they are so easily influenced by their emotions and not their mind.